uh, going back to genocide, uh, what happened in Rwanda, uh, you attribute that to, uh, there's a Malthusian explanation, you attribute that to overpopulation? In part. The Rwanda, Rwandan genocide, there were many things that went into it. One is that Rwanda is the most densely populated country in Africa, and its population was growing throughout the 1980s. The world market for Rwandan products declined, so there was less money in Rwanda. There was political tension between two ethnic groups, the Hutu and the Tutsi. And finally, there was a political contest, and it all exploded in 1994 when six million Rwandans solved, if you want to use that word, their population problems, at least in the short run, by using machetes mostly to kill one million Rwandans and drive two million into exile. And Rwandans were very matter of fact about it. There was a Rwandan who said, genocide is nature's way of solving population problems. And another Rwandan said, the people whose children went to school without any shoes on killed the people whose children did have shoes to go to school. Could uh, what happened in Rwanda be a blueprint? It could be. Um, what, uh, a worst case scenario would be that if world population grows, as it did in Rwanda, and if stress on world resources increases, as it is now and has happened in Rwanda, then it may blow up on a worldwide level in mass warfare. But we've already seen that twice in the last hundred years. World War II and World War I each killed something like 50 million people. Do you see that uh, we have signs of collapse of our own uh, society? On the one hand, there are no signs of collapse. You and I are sitting here having a pleasant conversation and there's still water flowing out of my tap and there's green grass on the lawn outside. So to say the world is about to collapse is ridiculous. There's still water from the tap. On the other hand, there are, there are countries where government has already collapsed. In Somalia, government has collapsed, and that's why the coast of Somalia is beset with pirates with no government to control them. In the New World, the government of Haiti, which is the poorest country in the New World, has virtually collapsed. The government of Haiti cannot provide clean water and sewage and electricity to most of its citizens. So we are placing a stress on world resources and a, a pessimistic view of what will happen to the world is that conditions like Haiti will gradually spread and what's happening in Haiti now may happen in Peru and in parts of Brazil and gradually will spread until the whole world ends up like Haiti. But I hope that doesn't happen and I don't think it will happen. Even though the title of your book is Collapsed, you call it an optimistic book. Why? It's an optimistic book because the problems that we're facing are problems that are completely in our power to solve. If it were the case that the biggest problem that we face is that there's some big asteroid out there and it's on a collision course with Earth and this asteroid is one quarter of the diameter of the moon, there's nothing we can do about it. The situation would be hopeless. But our problems are not of an asteroid coming towards us. Our problems are problems that we are causing ourselves. We are causing problems by chopping down too many trees, by harvesting too many fish, by burning too much fossil fuel, by releasing too many toxic chemicals into the waterways. And all that we have to do to stop, to reduce our risk of collapse is to stop doing those bad things. We know what we have to do. It's a matter of finding the political will to stop doing those bad things. One interesting thing is that uh, you write about how um, you don't see big corporations, big businesses as being necessarily the enemy. 11 years ago, I, regarded big businesses as the enemy. There's no doubt that they're tremendously powerful. There's also no doubt that many businesses are very destructive. And I've gradually learned in the last 11 years that there are big businesses that are taking good care of the environment. In fact, over the last 11 years, more and more businesses have become concerned with the environment for a couple of reasons. One is that the, the presidents and the CEOs of big businesses have children themselves and they drink water and that they're at risk of getting cancer and their children come home and ask them, Daddy, what did you do in your company today? And, and the CEO tells them and the, the teenage daughter says, 
Daddy, I hate you and I'm never going to speak to you again. That really gets the attention of a CEO. So CEOs recognize in their own interest, some of them, that they better run the world better. And another reason is that they are discovering that they can save money by using fewer resources. So for example, Walmart, Walmart in the United States is a huge business, perhaps our biggest retailer. And most Americans love to hate, most Americans, many Americans who do not shop at Walmart love to hate Walmart. But the son of the founder of Walmart, his son is a river fishing guide. And he, the son of the founder himself, likes to go snorkeling and scuba diving. And he gradually discovered that there are fewer and fewer fish on the coral reefs because the reefs are being over harvested. So one of the biggest forces for the good of fishing around the world today is a year ago, Walmart said that within the next few years, we're going to buy all our fish from sustainably managed fisheries, and we're not going to buy any more fish from destructive fisheries. That's a decision perhaps more important than almost any government in the world could take. It's an example of how big businesses can be constructive. And I've also seen that oil companies, some of which make horrible messes, can also be extremely clean when they choose to do so. In the conclusion, you point to two things that uh, may save us from what happened to societies that uh, self-destruct. We have television and archaeologists. Television, despite all the mediocre television programs in the United States. I don't know how it is in Brazil. Perhaps in Brazil, all television programs are intellectual and instructive. But in the United States, that's not the case. Nevertheless, television and newspapers and radio are a major force that may help us solve problems because we can learn about what's happening in distant places. So you turn on the television set and you see the messes that are going on in Haiti or in Afghanistan today, but you can also see the good policies that are being carried out in Norway and some other countries. So one can choose we, to follow the good examples and to avoid the bad ones. But when the Easter Islanders in around 1680 were chopping down the last tree on Easter Island, they didn't have television to tell them what was happening around the world at the same time. And our other advantage is we have archaeologists, so we can learn of the mistakes made in the past and also of the wise decisions made in the past. The Inca, the Inca Empire, had a very forward-looking policy of replanting trees to maintain their forests. Well, we have archaeologists and we can learn about that. But the Easter Islanders didn't have any archaeologists, and so they didn't know about the stupid things and also the wise things that have been done in the past. Perhaps the main reason why I have some cautious hope that the world may be okay, if we want it to be okay, 50 years from now, is that we have these advantages of television and the media on the one hand and archaeologists and historians on the other hand. So we have the opportunity to learn, and no past society had that opportunity.